Hey everyone, Encore Performance back with another video in which we'll be playing the Barbarossa campaign without any deaths. As we hop into the first mission, we immediately task our villagers to work and rush to deploy our small force of troops. All must head southwest, but the scout, who will go the opposite direction northeast to speak to the Cuban mercenaries. In this scenario, we must capture four of the six relics located in enemy bases, and to do this, we begin by attacking Burgundy immediately. With a slight amount of micro, their base begins to crumble. We then purchase the Cuman troops, immediately ordering them towards Cyan. We are forced to defend a few assaults from the various feudal kingdoms surrounding us by garrisoning our villagers within our town center. During this time, our assorted group of horse archers we purchase from the Cumans defend the siege onders while they tear through Cyan's TC. After cleaning up Bohemia, we finish off Pink by destroying these two trade carts. We have a very, very close call with our villagers to a Saxon Mangonel, and for this, yellow is who we shall target next. Since we have knocked out two of our six opponents, we can play defensive for a moment. After rescuing our force in the north, we take some time to secure the very easily defendable islands with a few castles in the right places, allowing us to move out once more. Once we advance to the Imperial Age, we amass an armada of cannonguides and rain projectiles down upon Yellow City while giving them enough time to evacuate the final relic to the west into Orange's town. In a quick move, we capture Yellow's city, replacing his gates with our own, but keeping the walls, hence forcing our enemies to attack us in strategic choke points. We deal with a rather large force of pikemen before researching the spy's technology and moving out with the castle drop of our own. Thankfully, time is on our side, and we can slowly starve our enemy out. As time goes on, he uses more and more of his resources to build pikemen that he will merely throw away at our castles to their pitiful deaths, till finally we can make our move and use a small force to capture the last two relics, dubbing us as Victor of Barbarossa I as an immortal. In mission 2, we start on the clock. We only have a maximum of 10 minutes before Henry the Lion turns on us, and that could be very problematic. If we are not fast enough, Henry will overpower us, or at least keep us out of the game long enough for Poland to defeat our allies. For this reason, we must take the fight to him, and we begin to do this by immediately training petards and a group of cavalry archers with our starting resources. We then declare war on him, and in the one second of delay before he realizes what's even going on, our petards turn the castle to dust, along with damaging the barracks. Small time later, after Henry's been eliminated and we've gained some villagers, which we construct a TC with, all while fending off Poland's attacks as they get more and more ambitious, mean further and further with their raids. When we are forced to engage Blue's Mangonels, we get into their minimum range before stopping to fire, allowing us no death engagements. Now that we have survived the first few engagements, we boom up and secure our flanks, pushing only to the north, until we can force Poland into a state where they are constantly on the back foot. With a few walls and castles this is achieved, we now build a large force of rain siege some trebs to finish off Blue's fortifications to the north, and fleet of cannon gallons to fire onto Poland from the many rivers placed conveniently all around his production buildings. Hey, I'm not complaining. Some demos are built to take out the Polish docks, then our armada sails in, and within a matter of minutes, we win with a KD of 283-0. to zero. Not bad. After looking at the stats and returning to the map for a moment, we moved on to mission 3. We start with a few monks, ships, and troops, and must head east to capture some villagers by merely getting close and chanting the holy words of Lululu in their ears. Before doing that, though, we'll send our small fleet as far north as possible in an attempt to protect them. After a small engagement with the defending force of Greenstown, we are free to convert the entire settlement building by building and villager by villager until finally we own all Green has to offer but the one final obstacle in our way, his TC. We construct a mangonel, and with a bit of micro, his last structure is destroyed and replaced with a town center of our own by our newly converted villagers. We defeat Crimea, construct a large number of villagers, and then hurry to secure Cremona, not to be confused with Crema, our ally, not the enemy, support by constructing two castles, one in each side of the entryway. Thankfully, they are constructed just in time to defeat another river guard assault. Now, we attempt to cover the entire coast with castles, preventing any enemies from landing. You may wonder, but Encore, where are we getting all this stone from? Thanks to our ally, we can trade for gold, and then buy stone with that very gold. Our goal is to rule the sea, and to achieve this, pink stocks must be raised. We also have to convert the cathedral in Milan, 
as a victory condition, but after securing the neutral island with a castle, and then another castle even further south, that should be easy to accomplish. By using trebuchets' covering fire, we can push back enemy galleons and allow the castle on screen to be completed. Upon this small victory, we research spies and begin to plot our capture of Milan. We land trebs, fire on a tower or wall, pack up, and sail back to the safety of our riverbed until there is a cl clear enough breach in Milan's defenses. We now build a castle here, and wait a moment. Trigger goes off, and Milan sends out a large group of Genoese crossbows, who are then promptly cut down by castle fire, allowing us to continue our fortifications creeping closer and closer to the goal of the cathedral. We place a gate on the far side and begin the conversion, when suddenly an enemy, an enemy trebuchet threatens the livelihood of one of our own. I have been told, not all heroes wear capes, but these ones certainly do as our Teutonic knights dash to the rescue just in time, giving us our third success with no losses. On to mission four, and oh boy this one is a tough one. We must immediately pause, then order our troops commands. The moment I unpause, projectiles fly through the air, and our troops barely make it to the transports alive before sailing away. Telling you this only took one try would be like telling someone Conan knows how to build more than one lumber camp. We leave four villagers here to the south, but bring everybody else north, merely to unload the troops and then sail back down to the bottom with our fleet, where they'll hide in this little river. We construct a few castles just in time for the first attack to arrive. Hurry troops, into the castles, the enemy is... is... Is their monk rushing? Our castles? It doesn't matter. Fire on the old man and do it now. At least I think that's how the dialogue went when I realized Yellow was monk rushing me. You see, we must build a wonder in any one of our opponent's cities for the victory. Not even defeat them, just build a wonder in a city. A fairly simple goal, but after I heard of the atrocities committed against my Discord members by such cruel AIs, I knew I had no choice. I must avenge my friends and eliminate all of the cities. This in itself was no easy undertaking, but at least Henry the Lion had my back. Right, Henry? Henry, where'd you go? Oh, look, you betrayed me. Again. Well, let's add him to the list. We begin with Padua, who builds mostly Calviaris, Trebs, and Archer units. After building a castle or two on the settlement's perimeter, we can distract the other enemies while tearing the city apart with siege from a distance. Green is easily pushed back, allowing us to repeat the same strat as in Mission 1 where we make his walls our walls. Oh, I love communism. At least I think that's what this is. After building the biggest fleet scene since the sixth mission of El Cid, we annihilate Venice's island fortress before repairing our entire fleet. Actually, we didn't repair it, just this one lady. She did it single-handedly, and if that doesn't make you pity her yet, she's not even being paid. Welcome to the Middle Ages where the minimum wage is non-existent. Now, we sail our ships west, and end up turning the city to ash as well. Fortunately, unlike Padua, Venice doesn't manage to escape with a few villagers and is defeated on the spot. Boy oh boy, do I love cannon galleons. In a pincer move, with troops from the north and our fleet from the south, Yellow finally begins to fall, leaving only Henry as a major threat. We need more pop space, but are currently at our cap. If only we had some demo ships around here to throw out the Venetian seawall for population. Wait, we do! We see a lot of action to the south, where we are pushed back extremely far, for thankfully we pull off a quick wall to save our villagers. After much castle crawling, spies researching, and bombard cannon firing, we learn, after we've defeated Henry, the yellow can't actually be defeated, otherwise we would win, so we are forced to build the wonder. You may have noticed in Alaric 2, when we finished the scenario, we did it with a salute, with all of our troops assembled, since it took so much of our time. Well, as you can see here, we have all of our troops ready as we finish off the wonder. It's amazing to think that we completed such a scenario with these troops solely. Finally, we can rest easy knowing our discord has been avenged and we are victorious without one death. We begin our fifth mission, Barbarossa's March, without any villagers and will not be able to gain any throughout the mission. It's a simple point A to B mission with a rather large army, and not only are our forces quantity, they are also quality, elite Teutonic knights, right beside paladins and siege onagers. We start off by sending our unique units towards an abandoned farmhouse, when a group of Saracen Mamluks appear and ambush our forces, so they think at least. With our Teutonic Knight's ridiculously high melee armor, our infantry takes one damage for every 18 they inflict. It's a quick fight to say the least. Now we must prepare to sack the city of Constantinople. 
Upon using our paladins to lure the cataphracts out, we cut them down before sending in Teutonic Knights to engage the infantry who have fallen behind. By this point, our cavalry are free to flank the infantry and engage the Byzantinian siege, cutting down the settlement's garrison in a matter of seconds without a loss. We bring trebuchets up to rain projectiles down upon the beautiful city. I mourn every second in which we damage such a wonderful settlement, but it is what we must do to be deemed victorious. Our other option would be to head south, where we would be forced to engage a large Saracen force and then attempt to outrun their galleons with our slower, defenseless transports. No, we need Constantinople's armada to stand a chance. After a short bombardment, a path is cleared, allowing our paladins a clear route to the Hagia Sophia. Once this is accomplished, we are granted control of the fleet. We select only the vessels of war for the next bid. We'll use demos to damage the Saracen ships blockading the port, then finish them off with the rest of our warships. We can now safely head south until we are there. We quickly unpack a trebuchet with its high radius of sight to scout out the surrounding territory. After this, we head east, where we'll liberate a few cavalry archers who will be extremely helpful later on. Once we are certain our fleet is safe and secure within Constantinople's sea walls, we attack a Seljuk camp and destroy a castle along with its garrison before heading even further into enemy territory. The intended route would be insanity to attempt without deaths. Should we head straight south, we will find a break in the cliffs blocked by trees and guarded by enemy bombards. We now use the cavalry archers to deal with them, along with some micro. We then bring onagers up to chop a path through the forest. After this, we merely select our paladins and order them towards the Hospitaller camp. We are chased by a group of Orinlu fans for a moment, but we eventually outrun them and arrive at the camp. Here, we are dubbed winner without a single loss once more. After this, we head into the very final mission, the one I commonly refer to as the Pickle Barrel one. We begin with a small amount of military, a large group of villagers, plentiful stocks of resources, and of course, the pickled body in a barrel. There is a 10 minute treaty in place, so we use this to our advantage to walk through Damascus unharmed, then construct a siege workshop to build onagers to raise the walls on the south end allowing us closer to our goal of Jerusalem, who is still an enemy at the moment. We had also sent villagers west at the beginning of the mission and constructed a small economy. Our onagers now finish destroying the wall and we exit the side door we've created, head to the edge of Jerusalem's walls, where we will construct two castles, each upon hills, granting them plus 25% damage. Clock runs out seconds after the construction is completed, and all garrisonable units do so, while the pickle barrel and siege stay off to the side where they are safe. After building a treb, we pick off a tower and a few monks before sending in our last hope as the castles begin to fall to the many enemy troops. Four petards charge in and blast the secondary wall open, allowing the trade cards to weave past enemy towers straight to the Dome of the Rock, granting us the bragging rights of having completed the Barbarossa campaign without any deaths on the hardest difficulty possible. Remember guys, if you'd like to join my Discord, link will be in the description. From there, you can let me know what campaign to try next. Encore out, have a good one.